One of the reasons we have two lectures on self-pollinated crops is about half of today's lecture will sort of be an introduction to crop breeding in general and talking about the general principles of developing cultivars, the effects of the type of pollination method on how we develop the cultivars, and the effects of inbreeding, outbreeding on really the genetic structure of a population. Then we will start talking about some specific features of self-pollinated crops. But early on, we'll revisit this concept of, of uh, variation and heritability. And hopefully we'll clear up for most of you the, the uh, differences between narrow sense and broad sense heritability and additive and non-additive genetic variation. And by the end of the lecture, we'll sort of get to the very first topics on breeding self-pollinated crops. And that's really two methods that were used originally in going from land races just to purify lines out of land races. On Friday, we'll continue self-pollinated crops, but talking more about what's done today, where most self-pollinated crop breeders make hybrids and generate F2 generations to get variation and then use various breeding methods to select for that newly generated uh, superior recombinants from that newly generated population. And then Monday we'll talk about breeding cross-pollinated crops as synthetic varieties or open pollinated varieties and talk then about the problems in cross-pollinated crops with inbreeding depression and sort of the mechanism to remove those problems by heterosis. And then uh, next Friday, we'll talk about breeding hybrids. So with that, uh, cultivars are basically genetically similar plants, groups of genetic similar plants, which can be differentiated by some means from other groups of genetically similar plants. And in order to have a cultivar, the three characteristics that I like are, are sort of what's present and, and required to get intellectual property protection. They must be distinguishable from other varieties. So there must be a number of genetically controlled traits that distinguish your cultivar from some other. They must be uniform so that when you plant out a field of your cultivar, all the plants are fairly uniform looking in appearance and performance, and they must be stable over different years of production. And in fact, in uh, Europe, uh, the system of UPAV for registering varieties goes through DUS, distinguishability, uniformity, and stability. The types of cultivars that we deal with, with self-pollinated crops, they're usually pure line cultivars. But more and more frequently today in self-pollinated crops, they're F1 hybrids. Cross-pollinated crops, usually they're open pollinated varieties or synthetic varieties or hybrids. Clonal cultivars, can be either self or cross pollinated. They use most often with species that have high value, are very heterozygous, and or are easily asexually propagated. The factors that affect what type of cultivar you'll develop with your crop of interest, the mode of reproduction is probably the most important but the cost of the product you're going to produce and sell versus the performance and value of that product are also very important. There would be a lot more hybrid varieties grown today if you could produce the hybrid seed at a price that would guarantee a return on investment to the farmer in terms of added value when they grow the hybrid seed. So hybrid seeds are very, very common in vegetable varieties where the price of seed is very, very high. You pay 15 or $20 for 25 or 50 seed. 
versus a crop like maize, where you pay today, I guess, a hundred, hundred and twenty dollars for a bag of eighty thousand kernels. So the economic value of the crop determines what sort of cultivar you develop. The distribution system that's available, and, and you can imagine that varies tremendously from a country like the United States or most European nations, where we can have very well-developed private networks to produce and distribute hybrid or variety seeds versus some developing countries who are often in dire need of hybrid seeds to improve their performance, but we don't have the infrastructure to produce and distribute that seed and get it to the farmer year after year in a reliable fashion. And of course, the environment where the crops produce will affect what sort of cultivar. If, if you're dealing with a highly uniform environment with not much problems from disease or insects and uh, mechanically harvested type of agriculture, the more uniformity, the better. If you're dealing with a substance farming situation where your variety is going to be intercropped with other crops, much less mixtures of different varieties of the same crop, then, then uniformity is not that important but still stability and reproducibility are very, very important. So basically the types of cultivars that are primarily developed are either pure line varieties, synthetic varieties or varietal hybrids. F1 hybrids are clonal cultivars and of course the breeding procedures not only depend on what type of variety is your endpoint, but the traits that are most important to you. Yield, quality, disease, insect resistance, stress tolerance, the resources you have in your program, and often personal preferences. What's a synthetic variety? Pardon? A synthetic variety. We'll talk about that, and in fact, Don Vians will give you an entire lecture on how to produce it. A synthetic variety is basically used in open pollinated crops where you develop a series of cross-pollinated individuals and you select sort of the superior performing. And if you self those, you get all sorts of bad effects. So you basically take a series of cross-pollinated individuals and you put them in isolation so that they will only interpollinate each other and not other undesirable plants. And, and you just produce a synthetic. You synthetically blend different varieties and mix that seed together for two or three generations to get enough for commercial release. We'll talk more about that a little later today. So in these various cultivars, pure line varieties often, most always used with self-pollinated <coughs> crops. You first have to select if you have genetically diverse populations or develop a genetic, genetically diverse segregating population. So step one is you have to have variation, genetically controlled variation. Step two in these pure line cultivars, you inbreed to get homozygous pure line plants. You evaluate and select the superior inbred lines. Then you increase and distribute pure line varieties. Synthetics, select and cross a number of superior genotypes in all combinations to develop the variety, as I just mentioned, or you can have open pollinated varieties where you basically take a number of parents in maize, for instance, you can take a series of half-sib families, detassel the whole series, and have a different series of, of uh, half-sib families to use as a male and so you can actually look for combinability or heterosis as well you know it's just a little more control over a synthetic variety. In both cases in breeding with cross-pollinated crops we deal with recurrent selection. So we'll hit this theme over and over in self-pollinated crops it's get a lot of genetic diversity or variation as much as you can and then it's hurry back to uniform homozygous state. In cross-pollinated crops you can't get that uniform homozygous state. It doesn't do you any good. 
So what you do is you take heterozygous cross-pollinated individuals and you cross-pollinate and select and cross-pollinate and select and cross-pollinate and select. So you recombine and select and recombine and select. And that's recurrent selection. For F1 hybrids, you do a little bit of both. You first have to, for cross-pollinated crops, you have to develop inbred lines by selfing or inbreeding genotypes to homozygosity. Unfortunately, we'll talk uh, probably next Wednesday, inbreeding depression then lowers the performance of those self materials. So then you have to evaluate those materials for combining ability by making hybrid combination, which restores heterosis and performance. Then you can multiply the inbred lines to use as parents and produce and distribute F1 hybrid seed. Of course, for self-pollinated crops, you already have uniform, vigorous inbred parents. What you do is you just cross those parents to produce F1 hybrid seed and distribute. For clonal cultivars, you develop the genetically diverse population, you evaluate and select superior clones, and then you don't worry about how those clones sexually reproduce because you're going to vegetatively propagate them. So if you're lucky enough to deal with a vegetatively propagated or clonal crop, you get around a lot of the problems of inbreeding depression and restoring heterozygosity. All right, a uh, couple of concepts that are, are somewhat similar, I guess, although I don't, don't seem to be to me, but confusing. Heterogeneity or homogeneity just refers to mixtures. If you have a mixture of individuals that are all just about the same, it's a very homogeneous mixture. If you have a mixture of individuals that are quite distinct, it's heterogeneous. Homozygosity and heterozygosity is a genetic term. It means either individuals are almost entirely homozygous at all loci or predominantly heterozygous at most genetic loci. And so when we deal with self-pollinated crops in the wild, we have a heterogeneous population of homozygous individuals. So I think this is rice. I think you can see there's some brown plants more mature, some green plants less mature. But I'll show you in, a, in another slide. It doesn't look like a pure line variety. It's a heterogeneous mixture of individual homozygous plants. In cross-pollinated crops, we have the same sort of heterogeneous mixture. Some of these plants have already tasseled out in this maize field. But the plants are heterozygous. So you can look at the field and see if it's heterogeneous or not, but you have to look at the genetics to see, or you have to know whether it's self or cross-pollinated to know whether it's homozygous or heterozygous. And I think you have this in one of the early lectures that's very important crops that are self-pollinated. Then just another overview slide. So within self-pollinated crops, the breeder's job is to exploit the nature of individual homozygous plants. So the focus, therefore, is on individual plants within populations. And if you're focusing on selecting individual plants for plants that just look good to the eye, then your really qualitative inherited characteristics receive your major attention. Qualitatively inherited meaning relatively simple genetic control, a lot of dominant versus recessive traits so that you select for the right maturity, the right plant type, the right head or grain size and qualitative traits. For cross-pollinated crops, you've got to exploit the heterozygous nature of the individual plant. So you focus on a population of plants because you can't, if you self that individual, you lose everything. So you focus on a population and therefore more emphasis is placed on quantitatively inherited traits. And these differences will become more apparent hopefully over the next two weeks.
All right, and self-pollinated crops. A homozygous locust will remain homozygous forever, barring mutation at the rate of one in a million or one in five million. Heterozygous loci will segregate in each generation, producing half heterozygous and half homozygous progeny. So every time you self, you lose heterozygous, the numbers of heterozygous individuals. So if you have plants selected from a mixed population after five to eight self generations, they will normally reach a practical level of homozygosity. What is a practical level? 98% plus or minus a few percent, mostly homozygous. So if you start with a mixed population of self-pollinated plants, composed of plants with different homozygous genotypes, and you select and self plants of different genotypes out of that, you can get very, very pure line cultivars, but each population that you develop will be different and it will be based on the different homozygous plant that you started selfing and selecting. And this is just for your benefit. This shows present homozygosity. You basically increase by 50% or you lose 50% of your heterozygosity each generation. So basically, if, if you sell for affinity, you can theoretically get to 100% homozygous. That never happens in nature because a lot of these, you know, I guess if, if you self by hand every generation, barring mutation, you could get here after, oh, a few hundred crosses or a few hundred generations. But in nature, if you allow the plants to self-pollinate, most of these crops have a little bit of outcrossing, outbreeding. So if we get to 98% homozygous in a pure line cultivar, that's pretty good. So here it is again, the individual plants are homozygous and of course the plants homogeneous populations are homozygous but heterogeneous. The land race varieties, homozygous but heterogeneous. The pure line varieties, homozygous but homogeneous. You develop varieties that every plant pretty much looks identical to every other plant in the population. All right, to go back now and talk about, I, I pointed out that in self-pollinated crops, you either select populations that are segregating genetically, or Friday we'll talk about how you create those populations to segregate. That variation that you see may be based to environment or to genetics or heredity. And heritable variations originate from gene recombination, variation in chromosome number or ploidy, or mutations. And crossing over and recombination, I got a lot of answers on how do you use outcrossing to get genetic variation. Basically, the three major ways are gene recombination, ploidy, and mutations, with the top two being far more common in terms of producing desirable genetic variations than mutations. To point that out, a guy named Johansson, who really did a lot to start this science of plant breeding, went into a barrel of beans. These beans had been self-pollinated for a number of generations, and he selected a little bean and a big bean. And he self-pollinated the little bean, and he grew out the progeny. And he selected a little bean and a big bean from that material and grew out the progeny. The same thing with the big bean, self grew out the progeny. And he started thinking, and he says, well, wait a minute. Then from here down to here, I'm dealing with a 98% homozygous population of plants. There's not much, if any, genetic variation among all of the progeny from this little bean. So the amount of variation I see here must be due to the environment. And the same thing for the big beans. But he says, but when I selected this little bean, you know, it, it, it still gave me genetic variation, but 
genetic variation of a bunch of little beans. Whereas over here, I got genetic variation of a bunch of bigger beans. So there must be some genetic differences between this whole group and that whole group. And, and so that was sort of our original thinking on the concepts of variation. So he selected large and small beans. He measured the weights. He said the variation between the weights of individuals in the homozygous self lines was due to the environment. The variation between lines was due both to genetic and environmental factors. And so that leads us back to our quantitative inheritance, that the phenotype is the effects of genetics plus environment plus the interaction. And that within the genetics, we know we can have additive dominance or those other things that we just call interactive effects. All right, additive effects, basically each allele can be summed. Each allele gives a discrete incremental effect so that if you deal with genotypes, big A, big A, big B, big B, you have four dominant alleles, you get an effect of plus four. If you deal with big A, little a, big B, big B, you have three dominant alleles, the effect is plus three. If you move over here where you have two dominant alleles plus two, and the same thing coming down, where finally if you have no dominant alleles, you get the effect down to zero. So very simply, additive effects. Each dominant allele incrementally adds one unit to whatever trait we're measuring. Whereas in dominance, it doesn't matter whether you're a big B, big B, a big B, little b. As long as you got one big B and one big A, you're going to get that expressed as if both of these alleles were active. And so you get a factor here of four. And the same thing, and even big B, little b, big A, little a, still four. It's only here when you lose the big A allele, and you have no big A alleles that you drop to two, or here, you have no big B alleles, you drop to two, or if you don't have any dominant alleles, you don't get any, any improvement for that particular trait. And, and you can go through these, uh, epistatic and, and uh, overdominance, but basically, the epistasis means you have to have an interaction between the A locus and the B locus. So as long as you have at least a dominant A and a dominant B, you get that interaction. If you don't have dominant A, there's nothing to interact with a dominant B, and so you get no effect. Or if you have, don't have a dominant B, there's nothing to interact with a dominant A, so you don't get any epistatic effect. And overdominance means that a heterozygous locus is better than the best homozygote. So here, A, A, big B only gets two units, but big A, little a, big B, big B, gets three. And when you get down to the two heterozygous states, you get four. And, and I know these bottom two are hard to see with this model. The epistatus is a little more easy than the overdominance. But in both of these models, it's better if you don't think about big A, big B, but B1, B2, B3, B4 alleles. Different functional alleles at different loci. All right? So additive variance is variance that is due to the effects of each individual allele being added together. No interactions with other alleles or other genes. So the simplest way to increase the performance of a trait is to keep adding alleles that give additional increments of performance. So does additive occur with pure condolence? Uh, it, do, it, it really doesn't matter. As long as you have, if you add a functional allele, so 
We don't even worry about the dominance. You could theoretically have A, A prime that are co-dominant. As long as you add an A or an A prime that's a functional allele, you're fine. And that's the, the simplicity of additive is you don't worry about allelic interactions at a locus and you don't worry about interactions of alleles at different loci. So, I mean, very, very simplistic. Well, when you try to sort out the complexities of all of the genetics for very complex traits in a population, having a nice simple model to build on is very, very useful. And so additive genetic variance sort of provides that very, very simple model. Right, dominance variance is due to interactions between alleles or effects due to two alleles that can either make a trait greater or lesser than the two alleles acting alone. So dominance gives you problems because you can have co-dominance or incomplete dominance. Or, boy, so, so it starts getting tricky. Uh, what, 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 do, what does each additional allele that I add contribute? Uh, if I've got a dominant allele in place, it masks a recessive allele, which in the progeny will segregate out and have a quarter recessive recessive and will be detrimental. Uh, but more importantly, dominance variance is not inherited directly from the parent to the offspring. I mean, the parents give one homologous chromosome of each set to the offspring. So if you have a parent that's heterozygous, big A, little a, the parent will only contribute a dominant A or a recessive A to the offspring. And, and so... It, it dominates genetic variance is less useful if you're trying to first crack that big problem of complexity in populations. So when we start looking at heritability, we say, okay, that's the, the degree to which values which exhibit in the parents are passed on to the progeny. And of course, heritability is based on phenotypic values or what the plants themselves look like, but it describes the ratio of genetic variance to total variance. So the phenotypic variance is equal to the genetic variance plus the environmental plus the interaction. And we know that the genetic variance is equal to additive plus dominant plus interactive variances. And, and so we say, okay, well, heritability then is the genotypic over the phenotypic. And the genotypic, or, or we can solve this, is the genotypic over the additive dominance, I'm sorry, over the genetic by environmental by genetic by environmental variances. We'll talk in a minute about how do you measure this. NarrowSense heritability considers this additive genetic variance only, so it's the additive variance over this genotype by environment by genotype environment complex phenotype uh, variance. All right. So here's the new slide. So if you have your slides printed out, this one's not there. So why is NarrowSense heritability a better measure? Dominance and epistatic effects are not lasting. They're ephemeral. They're altered by segregation and recombination, and they're dependent on the interactions of alleles. So when you go from parent to offspring, you get different interactions. You get different combinations of alleles coming together, and, and so you can't predict. Additive effects are just exactly what an individual can contribute to the progeny. The number of dominant or functional alleles that an individual has, it will contribute. The recessive alleles it contributes, you don't worry about. You only try to accumulate dominant or functional alleles. Sure. <laughs> 
All right. We can, in fact, I'll send a new version of this to Luis after class. And we can get that one added. All right, so we know that the variance in a population, if the population is genetically uniform, such as a highly inbred line or an F1 hybrid, then any variation that we see is due to environmental effects. If the plants are all genetically the same, any variation in performance is due to environmental effects, right? Whereas if you get a population that's not genetically uniform, such as an F2 generation or multi lines or a land race, it's due to both environmental and genetic interactions. And so we get back to this phenotypic variation due to genetic environmental so how, do we, how does that help us? Well, if you wanted to measure heritability and the relationship between total phenotypic variance and sort out the genetic and the environmental components, then you take two pure lines, you cross them, you produce an F1 and an F2 generation. You grow all of those generations in the same environment so that you're dealing with one two, three genetically uniform populations, the F2 being the only genetically diverse population. And so you say heritability then is the variation in that F2 minus the variation due to the environment, because the F2 has both a genetic and an environmental component, and it's divided by the variation in the F2. Okay, well, but then you know that within your F1, your parent 1, and your parent 2, there is no environment, there is no genetic variation. So the only variation you see in those populations is environmental. So you simply take the variation from F1, parent 1, parent 2, add them together, divide them by 3, and you say that's equal to the environmental variation. Well, <coughs> there is. We just ignore that. And, and if you work it out mathematically, the, the G by E interaction within this is very, very small. And, and to, it, it's tough enough for our statistician friends to give us useful formulas to follow. And so we take a lot of sort of liberal... Uh, exclusions and we say yeah there could be some interaction but that's error we can't measure that so that means that whenever we measure heritability we don't get a perfectly finite answer we get an estimate of the heritability knowing that there could be some error involved but everyone follows the concept the F2 is the only population and has both genetic and environmental. So if you take the environmental away from the F2, divide it by that total phenotypic variation, you can get to heritability and we can sort of estimate the environmental by looking at the variation of F1, P1, P2. All right, so why do we really use NeuroSense heritability? Well, because we can. Dominant variance can be predicted. And if you can't predict what's going to happen in the progeny from the populations that you developed, it's not very helpful. So dominance variation is not very helpful to us. And, and even though we know that some of the traits of importance are controlled by dominance gene action, yeah, well, but so what? We're trying to at least improve our population, and a significant part of our variation is controlled additively, and we can work with that and predict what's going to happen, so we use additive. Uh, dominant uh, doesn't affect the mean of variance in a systematic fashion because we have the mixture of alleles, and we have heterozygotes segregating out, and so only additive genetic variance is useful. And even though additive genetic variance isn't a complete picture, at least it allows us to start building up useful genetic variance. 
And so usually we use Narasense heritability, the variance, additive genetic variance over the total variance. But so that's nice. But also, Narasense heritability can be calculated fairly directly and in some cases easily from breeding experiments. So for this reason, it's also called realized heritability. So if we can calculate the additive genetic variability, we, we can get a real gain from population to population. And, and there are, there's lots of ways to do this. I'll only talk about one. If we want to look at heritability in an experiment, there are three things you can easily measure in a selection experiment. You can measure the mean of your original population. Very easy. Grow out the original population, harvest the plants, divide by the number of plants, get the mean of the population. You can take a number of individuals that you select for parents of the next generation, and you can very easily measure the mean performance of those parents. And then when you grow out your next generation of recombining those parents, grow it out, and you can very easily measure the mean. Well, these three means are related by the narrow sense heritability term such that the heritability of a trait is equal to the mean of that selected next generation minus the original divided by the mean of your original parent population or the, of the parents you selected minus that original population. And so very easily you can grow out your original population, you can grow out your parents, and you can grow out the next recombined population, calculate these means, calculate narrow sense heritability. And in fact, the denominator of this is sometimes called the selection differential, the difference between the total populations and the individuals selected. The numerator is the selection response, the difference between the offspring and the original population. Now you can also measure narrow sense heritability by doing a regression of the F2, selected F2 progeny values on the mid-parent value. And we won't go through that because it gets a, a little more complicated. But basically we use additive genetic variance because it can be used readily. And, and so we just ignore any non-additive genetic variation and we ignore any environment by genetic interaction terms and we totally ignore any epistatic or over dominance or those interaction variances that we know are in the genetic component. But what can we do though? We can get the selection of uh, genetic advance for population by calculating the average of the individuals selected, the uh, square root of the phenotypic variation in the parents, and the narrow sense heritability, we can calculate the percentage gain. And so we start with the population, we select 5% selection intensity, and we move the mean of our population up this increment, then we would select 5%, and we would generation after generation improve the performance of a population. Now we'll talk more about this in some of our, our uh, methods for selecting and developing uh, self-pollinated crops. And uh, Don Vians will come in in November and we'll do two weeks on how to derive a lot of these formulas and how you can utilize different methods of recombination and selection to make different rates of gains. But we won't worry a lot about that, especially for the next two months. All right, in breeding self-pollinated crops then, the objectives are to increase the frequency of superior genotypes, purify a mixed population with differing phenotypes, develop a new cultivar, and the success depends on the extent of variation in the population
and the heritability of the traits. And actually, uh, we'll, I'll end with this because we'll pick up on this. Our selection involves identifying and selecting desirable individuals, identifying the genetic variation versus the environmental based, and then either utilizing a mass or a pure line selection. And uh, we'll begin here uh, Friday. The, the uh, objective being going from a line mixture, or actually I'll pick up Friday with going from an F2 variate, uh, variable generation. The objective is to get back to an F5 or 6 generation as fast as possible so that up here you can either do phenotypic selection and, and sort of maintain things progeny from single selected plants down through various generations or you can select single plants and bulk their progeny but one way or the other we do basically phenotypic selection for qualitative traits until we get back to a relative state of homozygosity, then we move those materials out into replicated yield trials, progeny trials. And in these replicated trials then, we can measure the genetic versus the environmental variation on, on uh, each of those families. All right, Friday we'll, we'll, do, we'll talk about a lot of different ways to get from up here down below. But I think I'll quit there, even though there are probably like two or three more slides or so left in your uh, presentation today. Any questions?